to work on these uh, transfer functions. And uh, the objective is to, uh, again, uh, get this idea of how does finally the pressure produce a perturbation in heat release. But as I was telling one gentleman just, just now, in fact, the pressure produces velocity fluctuations and the velocity fluctuations produce uh, uh, area fluctuations and these area fluctuations give you heat release perturbations which produce pressure fluctuation. So this is, it, it's indirect. Of course, you can think, yes, the pressure itself may modify the, uh, the reaction rate in the flame. That's a possibility, but it's not so strong. In general, it's more through this pressure produces velocity, velocity changes, makes perturbations in the flow field and produces heat release fluctuations. Uh, in fact, what we are actually looking for is transfer functions of that kind, either uh, equivalence ratio or velocity. And so you have actually two transfer functions. Uh, we emphasize the transfer function for velocity. In fact, Fv and F phi can be are closely related uh, because of, if you remember the G equation, there was uh, the two terms were appearing on the right hand side and there is a transformation which can bring you, if you know Fv, you can get Fe. Uh, what happens also, what we've seen in flames is that they have a, a certain, they are more or less like filters. And, and so the band of uh, susceptibility uh, goes from the low frequencies up to a certain frequency. Beyond a certain frequency, the heat release fluctuations become very small. And so you have, uh, you have a region where the flame is, uh, uh, is responsive, and then you have, fortunately, regions where it's not. So it's important to know what is this band of, uh, uh, and what is the gain, and of course, what is the phase. So again, the, the situation is this one. We, we can have a very simple flame, put a loudspeaker, have the photomultiplier, get the velocity using a LDV, and, uh, and you see you have this V1 over V0 at that point. You measure V0, you have V1, and you, you measure Q1 over Q.0, and uh, this is proportional to the intensity level. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, signals, this is what you get. So you get, um, you, you operate at a given frequency and then you change the frequency. Uh, so this is the photomultiplier signal. It's the intensity. This is the velocity signal, V1. And uh, this is at uh, 10 hertz. This is at 30 hertz. These are conditions for this flame. Uh, these are typical signals. So again, this, this shows you the, um, the photomultiplier and this shows you the velocity. And so definitely you see that you can get a, um, a transfer function. It's simple to, in this case, the, uh, uh, the transfer function can be obtained very easily. Uh, so what we, we have this harmonic velocity fluctuations, get the heat release fluctuations. Uh, one very good method in, uh, in signal processing, as soon as you have noise, uh, that is, for example, if the flame is turbulent and you still want to get a, a transfer function, then you use a, a standard technique which consists of taking the power, the cross power spectral density of the output, so SXY with the input, and you divide by the power spectral density of the input. And this gives you the transfer function. So as soon as you have a signal which is noisy, uh, this is a very good way of, it's a, you calculate, you calculate the, the spectral densities. Uh, you go, uh, you use the standard methods to get the spectral densities. You have the input is x, 
the output is y. And what you do is you, the transfer function fv of omega is equal to s x y. So this, this is the cross spectral density as a function of omega divided by s x x of omega. So uh, that, that's the method that we use as soon as you have, for example, turbulent uh, flames. What you want is only the, the part which is corresponding to the acoustics, and you use these uh, uh, power spectral densities. The power spectral densities themselves are obtained by, uh, by taking Fourier transforms and uh, averaging. You cannot do that with a single Fourier transform. You have to do a real power spectral density. So uh, th this is the so-called method of periodograms, or the Welsh methods, or well, methods which are based on uh, actually the work of Wiener, Norbert Wiener from MIT, the famous mathematician. He uh, he developed these techniques. So uh, so the uh, we use power spectral densities. And uh, and so Q1 over Q0 is more or less like I1 over I0, uh, Fv times V1 over V0. So this is the gain and this is the phase. And for example, for a conical flame, uh, you see that uh, the data is here. These are the data. And uh, the modeling uh, is uh, if you take a uniform velocity upstream of the flame, it gives you the gain, which is here, which, which goes like right here. If you use a convective, uh, a convective velocity, it, it is somewhere here. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's very close. So the gain is not different. And uh, if you do a numerical work on the G equation, you have this expression here. This is it. The phase. Uh, if you use the uh, uniform uh, velocity model, you get a phase which, is, uh, which reaches pi over 2 here and which stays there. And that's not right because the phase is actually uh, making something more complex here. Of course, this is a logarithmic scale. So uh, what, what one sees, but basically the phase is, is following more or less, not quite, but it's following a constant uh, uh, time lag. So uh, uh, it's, it's more like that. Uh, and the, uh, it is because uh, what I told you that a convective mode is being produced, this is true when you are in the low frequency range. As you go to higher frequencies, uh, it's not so true. So there is a it, it's not quite as, uh, as simple as one may think. And numerically, you, you, you do get the right phase behavior here. So you integrate the G equation numerically, you get something which is reasonable. So, uh, but, but here you have all the information. You have the gain and the phase for this conical flame. Uh, then there, there is this uh, situation, this is the V flame. The V flame has a, has a different behavior because you have vortices which are shed here and which will interact with the flame and they will roll up the flame in this region here. And uh, I, I've shown you this data here. Definitely the, the changes in surface area and the pressure uh, go along well. Uh, and. Um, I think I have a film here, so you can see these vortices interacting with the flame. So this, this interaction here is driving this, uh, uh, this uh, process, and so the heat release will, will, have a, uh, uh, will have a time lag. There will be a time lag which will be uh, set by the velocity, the convection velocity of these vortices here. So uh, this will come out as we as we look at the at the transfer function. You will get this uh, behavior with uh, for the phase. Uh, 
Uh, this shows the vortices here. The flame front motion is controlled by the shear layer dynamics. So in this case, this flame is very uh, is submitted to these vortex structures, which are formed at the exhaust of this nozzle. So you you introduce here acoustic waves, and you produce a convective mode, which of vortices, which are shed here and which interact with the flame. Uh, that makes some beautiful films. Very informative as well. You can see uh, here, we seed the, fl the, the flow with the particles to do PIV. So th this is why we, how we got the vortices. And you see the vortices interact with the flame. They roll up the flame. And finally, this burns. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this produces flame surface area changes. Uh, which are translated in heat release fluctuations. So this is in the low frequency range. And here we have a, a higher frequency of 150 decibels, uh, 150 hertz. And you see now there are many vortices interacting with the flame. So the flame is, is, is this front here. Uh, the other one is the boundary of the, of the, of the flow. So you see the vortices interact with the flame. So this will have an effect on the heat release. Uh, this can be seen also right here. Whoops. You see this. This shows the. Um, this shows the behavior of the flame as as it interacts with the vortices right here. Uh, this is at the low frequency, at a, at, at a velocity of uh, a, a small velocity, and this is at a higher velocity. So definitely, we see these vortices, which are produced by the interaction between uh, between the acoustic fluctuations. They get to the to the um, to the exhaust of the nozzle, and they are transformed into a vertical. Uh, street, uh, a vortex mode, uh, and this then uh, interacts with the flame. And uh, 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 in terms of transfer function, this is what you get in this case. So this is experimental. I don't, yeah. You, you get a gain which goes above one. This is when the fluctuation velocity is low. And then it, it, it diminishes at about 200 hertz. So, so the, uh, the flame responds in a band up to 200 hertz in this case. And the phase is uh, essentially linear. What we did also here is to change the, the level of uh, perturbation. And you see that uh, the gain changes. As you increase the perturbation level, the gain diminishes. You see, you have a little more here. So this is a family of transfer functions, and it makes a describing function. So this will be used later. Uh, we have something which looks very much like a time lag. The time lag is essentially based on the, on the, the time it takes for the vortex to get to the flame and interact. So it's this, there is a time lag. And, uh, and of course, this time lag is very important because this will tell you the regions of uh, instability. Oops. All right. So that's that was the end of this uh, set of slides. So let's now look at some some of these in more detail and perhaps more theoretically. So let's take a. Uh, Um, so the first case is, is this one. All right. So what, what we are going to study here is now, uh, again, this situation where you have a flame interacting with a wall. So somebody was asking me, what, what about the conditions of the in terms of thermal conditions, uh, the interaction uh, of flames with the, 
heated walls or with cool walls and so on. In fact, this experiment can tell you a lot. Uh, in this case, we cool the, the plate and uh, we will see that uh, under certain cir circumstances, we have uh, actually oscillations taking place and uh, we can characterize that. So, um, now uh, what, is, uh, what is interesting here is that the flame is not confined, but it can have its own instability bands. So it's an unconfined flame. You just put a cool plate above the flame and you can have these oscillations taking place. In, in most practical applications, uh, flames are confined. And so we look at uh, situations which are exemplified here. Uh, we use, for example, the Rayleigh criterion. We know that pressure and heat release have to be in phase to get uh, energy growth. Uh, but there are situations uh, where the flames are essentially unconfined. For example, in domestic burners, the size of the burner is big, the flame is sitting somewhere there. And so uh, we've seen that even in such cases where the flame is not very strongly confined, uh, there can be resonance. Uh, a company which was producing radiant burners had problems with uh, uh, oscillations. The, uh, so in this case, the flame is sitting just at the end of the, of the burner and there is no uh, chamber be around it. And nevertheless, it can exhibit very powerful instabilities, which were, these were used for paper, uh, uh, drying, uh, you know, uh, when, you uh, when you produce paper and uh, they wanted to, to fix it. And so we, we started studying the dynamics of flames stabilized on, on the matrix and without any confinement. But of course, there is the upstream manifold. So uh, there are many cases where you have these situations where the flames are not so confined. And, uh, and so here is again our setup. Uh, what we are going to study here is a, so a cool plate flame. The, we use the same uh, um, equipment, the photomultiplier, a microphone at the bottom, a microphone here. Now this time, we, this whole system has no loudspeaker. So now this time we look at the stability of the, of the flame in this case. Uh, we, we, can we, we have a diameter which is 22 millimeters here and we can change the, uh, the, the, the distance. I think L is the, is the distance. What is this? No, it's the, it's the size of the burner. The burner size, 100 millimeter, 164, 228. Why? Because the burner itself has a resonance. Uh, 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 the, uh, in the low frequency range, it's the Helmholtz resonance. It's, uh, you have a bottle, you know that the bottle has a resonance. And this looks very much like a bottle. So we, we can actually write down the equations for, the, for this Helmholtz resonator. Now, it's, uh, the, it's a special resonator because you have flow in the resonator. You, it's not a resonator, usual, uh, you know, uh, a standard um, Helmholtz resonator is, uh, is looking like that. You have a, a volume and it's terminated by, by something like, like this. And that's it. Uh, this is it. You have a certain area here, a certain volume here, and this is the Helmholtz resonator. And this is used, for example, to damp oscillations. Uh, in this case, we have a flow through this resonator because we, we use the burner to, to, in, to input uh, pro, uh, methane and air. So, uh, so what is interesting is that in this configuration, you can have flames which are stabilized on the lip uh, if, the, if the plate is very far, you have a flame which takes this shape because uh, the whole flame is, uh, uh, has, the, has enough space to develop 
completely, so you have an envelope flame. If you bring this down and further down, this envelope flame becomes like a, like a waffle. And, uh, and, and finally, you can have a disc flame that is suspended in the air in between the nozzle on one side and the, the cool plate on the other side. So you have a flame which is just sitting there in the stagnation point. So you have these four possibilities. We are going to study this one, but the others are also interesting. And, um, and what is seen is that depending on the, on the distance between the nozzle and the plate, you can have regions which are very stable, very low levels of noise, 60, 65 decibels, and then regions where you have uh, very strong oscillations taking place right here. And this depends on the distance from the burner to the plate. This is, for example, for 100 millimeters. So you, th this is the sound level at a microphone at a, at a small distance from this device. And uh, so it's a, it's a nice little problem to study. Uh, in addition, when you look at the flame with uh, now these high-speed cameras, you can see that wrinkles are produced, for example, here. And if you look at the power spectrum of the noise, you, you see that uh, certain frequencies appear here and you have harmonics. So it's not a pure noise. It makes noise uh, at various frequencies. So it has uh, many harmonics. But we are going to essentially look at the first, at the fundamental. And um, if we change the, uh, the situation, we increase the, uh, the distance, we go to a place where there is no uh, instability, and then we go again to a situation where you have instability, and then you, you go down again, and you have a third instability taking place. So it's uh, just by changing the, the distance between the plate and the burner. So when the, when the burner is very far, you are in this regime. So you have uh, all sorts of wrinkles here and you are in this regime of instability. So uh, what, what we see also is that uh, as you change the, the distance, the frequency changes. You see, you have, uh, you have an evolution of the frequency, of the fundamental frequency, uh, which takes place in this SOTUS pattern. You, you are on the first instability, this is the second one, and that's the third one. And uh, the frequency is, is around 200 hertz. What sets that frequency? It's essentially the Helmholtz frequency, the frequency of this Helmholtz resonator. The resonator has a given frequency, and uh, you use that frequency to adapt to a given situation, to, to use it as a damper. Uh, in, in this case, by just changing the, we, we can actually study the changes in, in the, the size of the burner. You, you change the, the frequency, the fundamental frequency. But let's look at this one. Uh, now, if you look at the CH star emission, so this is, it looks like that. And uh, the LDV signal, is here, so this is the velocity at the burner exhaust, and you have a phase difference of about 3 pi by 2, which comes out in here. You can actually measure that just directly from the signals, or you can use, use the power spectral density and you get the phase directly from, from the power spectral density, the cross power spectral density. Uh, also, the, uh, the system, uh, this system behaves like a resonator. Uh, the frequency is around 200 hertz. This is the expression of the, of the resonance frequency of a Helmholtz resonator. L, uh, if, uh, effective, which is here, uh, is, uh, is the size of this uh, exhaust nozzle. It's, uh, it comes in here. This is the volume of the resonator, 
this is the, the, the sound speed, and S1 is a, is a typical uh, surface uh, of the resonator. So this is a, an expression that we know for Helmholtz resonators that can be actually uh, derived by doing a mass balance uh, for the resonator, and you get that. And what, what is this effective length? Well, it tries to take into account the fact that the, you see this is not quite a cylinder like, uh, like what I drew here. It's uh, something where the, the, the surface is changing. So you have some sort of, uh, it's, it's a little different. So basically it's the, the size of the nozzle, but you see as the nozzle has a, a shape, you can uh, take that into account. And, uh, and, and you can, of course, get the response by using the microphone here. You remember we use a loudspeaker, uh, we scan the frequencies and you can get, and you see that uh, the resonator has, a, has some damping. There is damping here. Of course, if you have a, a weaker resonance, you may have stronger damping. So it's a compromise between the resonance capacity and the damping. And uh, when you write down the equations, I'm not going to do that, but it's, it's in the paper, uh, you, 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 you get a, a system which is second order, uh, which has, uh, you see the velocity, it's the, deriv the second order derivative of the velocity, first order, and the zero, uh, and the velocity itself. And then you have a driver, and the driver here is, the rate of change of pressure uh, affecting uh, uh, on, on the surface here. You find out that it's the pressure that comes back towards the resonator that, uh, that uh, appears here. Uh, I haven't uh, derived it here in the, in the notes, but uh, you, you get that equation. So it's a second order equation. It has a resonance and it has a this term comes from the, the acoustics of the flame. The flame is producing pressure perturbations. Uh, they, they are applied to the system through the, the surface S1, so the exhaust surface. And you have uh, the damping here is essentially uh, it corresponds to the mass flow rate through the, through the resonator. So the, the flow rate through the resonator uh, will will act as a as a as a damper uh, will damp things. Uh, so this is the system damping the gas the stiff stiffness which is here is due to the uh, elasticity of the gases in the volume. Okay, so um, so now it is important to model p prime one. And what is P prime one? So here we use what we know about, uh, about uh, combustion noise. We know that pressure due to heat release fluctuations uh, can be written like that. This is the early work of Price. I've shown that in, uh, in the previous lecture with a certain uh, delay. This is the acoustic delay. And Q dot is uh, proportional to the intensity or to the area change. So I is the light intensity emitted by free radicals, or A is the flame surface area. Tau A is the, just the delay. It's a very sm small delay. This one is not very large because the system is pretty small. So, uh, so we know that the pressure is like that. And uh, so we can, we can actually uh, write the pressure that uh, uh, arises here to be proportional to the changes in surface area because these wiggles will change the surface area. You go from one to two to three, so you have changes in surface area with a small delay, there is a time lag. So basically the pressure is like that. You see this, this is shown here. And uh, what we've seen is that this is the CH emission. Uh, the microphone has this signal, and you see that this is very close to the derivative of the intensity. So it, uh, 
it tells you that, uh, uh, yes, there is this relation between the pressure and the heat release as it is uh, obtained from the intensity here. You see the acoustic pressure and time derivative of the heat release are similar, confirming that the source is suitably identified. So now we have this, uh, this model. We have velocity fluctuations here. The area is changing. And what we, we assume is that there is an interaction that uh, the area fluctuations are due to the velocity fluctuations that come in here. The velocity fluctuations correspond to those you know, we have this uh, uh, second order equation. So we have here A prime, and A prime is related to P prime, and we had the, the model for, for the resonator. And um, this just shows the, um, the transfer function uh, of the PM with respect to the LDV. So you, you definitely see that there is a phase a linear phase here. The phase is linear. So what is the, uh, the lag, the time lag for, for this? Well, it's the distance of the plate divided by the, uh, the velocity, the mean velocity. So the heat release, uh, the phase difference between the velocity and the heat release yields a mean convective time. It is of the order of Z over V1. So this time is is much larger than the acoustic time. So this will be an important driver of this instability. So now we have, this is the equation of the resonator. P is obtained from dA prime over dt. A prime itself is obtained from the velocity fluctuations. You put that here, and this is what you get. So you get a resonator, but on this side, you have also a, a term, which is like this one, but with a delay. You see, the, the delay is this sum, but basically it's the convective delay. So we have now a, a full model for the instability. This is a very simple system. You can build that in your garage. You will see these oscillations taking place. You have to cool the plate because at a point, uh, so if you want something proper, the, the plate should be cooled. And, uh, and now you, you can study that. This, this is a simple equation. You can do numerical work on that again, but you can certainly uh, study, uh, uh, you, you can study this completely. And uh, you, you can show that this equation has solutions uh, at uh, the resonant frequency F0 if this is, uh, if this is a, a good condition. So uh, there are definitely values of tau, which will give you oscillations. And this imposes a condition on the convective delay. So, so once you, you have that, you find that basically for certain delays, you will have oscillations instability. And uh, so the model gives you this, uh, it, it, it tells you also that the frequency is changing it is f over f0. f0 is 200 hertz, so you see the, the frequency changes here, and you have various bands of uh, oscillations that can take place. Uh, what, we, what we show here is the product of f0, the frequency times the time delay. It's nicer to work always in, in terms of uh, reduced quantities, uh, non-dimensional quantities. And, uh, and here what you get is uh, and the experiments actually follow that. You see, you, you do have oscillations, so you change the velocities, you, you have also different burners, so you change the burner sizes, and more or less things collapse. Not quite. It's, uh, uh, nature is more complicated than the models that you have, but uh, the model is able to retrieve the frequency changes uh, it retrieves the, uh, the positions of things, uh, and you have uh, definitely this, uh, this is, uh, there is uh, some, some uh, uh, matching, not perfect, but there is a good matching between experiments and calculations. So you, you understand this, the mechanics here. The mechanics is that uh, you have this convective uh, possibility 
there is a time lag there. As soon as we have a time lag, we know that uh, there can be an instabilities. But uh, these instabilities appear in certain bands. They don't appear if, if the time lag is in the right, uh, in the wrong uh, place. So strong instabilities, uh, the Helmholtz, uh, the, the frequency is uh, due to the Helmholtz resonator. Uh, and uh, what happens is that uh, one sees a, an annihilation of flame surface produced by, uh, by the interaction with the wall. And, and so we concluded that uh, flame wall interactions are very important. And uh, uh, even without a plate, uh, if you have flame surface variations, uh, and if you have an upstream uh, plenum that, uh, that can be resonating, then you may have uh, oscillations. Are there any questions here on this uh, first problem? So we, we have uh, something similar on, the, on this one. Uh, so here, what we, well, what we are looking now is the, the V-flame. Because we, we've seen a similar situation and the V-flame became unstable. There was no plate, it was just uh, by itself. Uh, you, you can have an instability of, uh, of this V-flame. And, uh, and uh, we, what we've seen before was the sensitivity of the V-flame to, to uh, upstream perturbations, but this time we can look at the stability of this V-flame. So again, uh, we, we can have flames which are not confined, but because of the upstream manifold, they can be... Uh, they can lead to instability. So in this case, what we have is a, is a flame stabilized on this uh, rod. Uh, we study that using a photomultiplier, a LDV, a microphone. You can place a microphone at the bottom. Again, this is the same burner. And we expect things of the same sort. What we have is, is the following. So we have to start somewhere. The, the velocity fluctuation produces heat release fluctuations. These heat release fluctuations produce pressure fluctuations. The pressure fluctuations produce velocity fluctuations. Of course, you have this resonance from, from the upstream. But upstream, you always have a plenum and things like that. So there are capacities to, to resonate. Uh, very, very often, you have something uh, which, which has uh, these features upstream. So uh, what is observed here is a excited, self-excited flame at 172 hertz. Uh, the flow velocity is here, the equivalence ratio. Velocity fluctuations about 0.14 meters per second compared to the mean velocity here. So um, delta Q over Q bar is a function of delta V over V bar. More, more. Q, Q prime over Q bar is function of V prime over V bar. So uh, in this case, this is 100 hertz. Uh, these are the conditions. And uh, we know that the, the describing function for these flames uh, look like that. So the gain uh, diminishes as you increase the, the level. So this, the transfer function doesn't stay the same. It, it changes with the amplitude. Uh, we also have a, a, a phase which is essentially linear, so this indicates that there is a, a time lag. And uh, it is possible actually to represent that by saying that the intensity, uh, so the heat release, is proportional to fluctuation of velocity with a certain time lag. So the time lag is, you know, the interaction between the vortices and the flame. So you have that here. So that's a model. And, uh, and we've seen that, that interaction uh, already. But this time, yeah, 
You see, this is the sort of interaction that we are looking at. So it's a convective. It, the, the, the vortices are convected, they interact with the flame, and this produces a time lag. So this is the unsteady vorticity field. We've seen that already. So now, uh, again, we, we, are, we have a Helmholtz resonator. Uh, this is the, uh, its, uh, its response. And uh, this, this is the typical resonance, angular resonance frequency square. This effective length of the throat of the resonator is here. Uh, we can obtain that using a loudspeaker, the microphone, and you plot the response, and you have a response like that, and you can see that it has a certain um, damping. And when you look at the, uh, at the equation for that, again, we, we get that equation. I'm not deriving this, but it's in the, one of the papers that we wrote. And uh, so this is the effective mass of the gases, the system damping, the stiffness of the gas volume. Uh, so the resonator is driven by external fluctuations in pressure. So we have to express this pressure fluctuations. Uh, and, uh, and so we can look at the signals and what we see, this is the microphone signal, uh, this is the uh, heat release signal, uh, the LDV and the pressure. And so All right. So uh, uh, we have these, and we find out that the pressure fluctuation here is proportional, in this case, to the, velo to the intensity, uh, to, the, to the heat release. It's strange, because in general, it was proportional to the time derivative, but when you look at the signals, it's, it is much more just directly the intensity and so um, this is the other possibility uh, that, that, it's, uh, that, that it's something like that. So on one side, that's one possibility. On the other side, this is the other one. So uh, uh, if, we, if we write the uh, intensity uh, fluctuation as a function of the velocity perturbations that come here with a convective uh, delay, which corresponds to the convection of the vortices. So here you see that uh, we, we can use that. And so P prime will be proportional to this, this value. And uh, actually, the, uh, there is also a time delay from, from this region here. But this delay is, is very small. So the, the main effect is these vortices, which are impinging on the flame. And, uh, and how, t how does one actually calculate the, the time lag? Well, you, you can take the, the streamlines and look at the vortices along the streamlines. And finally, you find out uh, a way to obtain this, uh, this time lag. And uh, it's by using 0.5 of the maximum velocity. So this is uh, this gives you the the convective velocity of the. So you you take that, put the pressure uh, in there, use the fact that the intensity is related to the velocity fluctuation with the time lag. This is the main time lag, and you have all these quantities. And now we have a. a an expression, and this time it's it's different. Instead of having the double derivative of the of the velocity, this is just a single derivative. So this term will come in combination with that one, but with a delay. This delay is not very important, but tau c is important. So in in this case, omega zero tau should belong to pi over two, three pi by two, modulo two pi, to get instability. So it's slightly different from the other one. 
The other one was was different because the this term was was different. We we found in this case a, a situation which is different. Why is it different? It's because the flame is in free air, and the interaction is between uh, the vortices and the flame. It it doesn't follow. It's not it's not a um, uh, you're not fully premixed because air can come in from from outside. So something different. So uh, so we have the gain and we have the phase and the phase has to be in in these bands to be unstable and definitely when you use a, a burner which has a, a frequency around here you are in this unstable band. So you get you, you get a, uh, a diagram which tells you that you can have instability. So the conclusion is that this uh, conical, inverted conical flames are sensitive to low frequency instabilities. The transfer function uh, phase grows linearly. There is a convective delay. The main wrinkling of the flame front is due to vortex structures created in the shear layer. And the, the rolling of these uh, uh, structures, rolling up of the flame, creates rapid variations of flame surface. And this is modeled here. And we have a model which tells you that instability will take place here. So these are two examples of all these uh, various uh, um, informations that are brought together and you get uh, an explanation for what you see in practice. I think, uh, yeah, so we are uh, at 12.03, so let's, uh, let's have five minutes discussion. So usually uh, you, you ask questions uh, as soon as, uh, as the clock stops, but uh, let's have some discussion. Yes. Yes. Uh, are there any advantages of using it instead of other more traditional approaches of static like bouquet analysis? L like what? Bouquet analysis. Yeah, repeat the question for sure. the. Sure. Yeah. Um, oh, I will repeat the question. So, but I have to understand the question first. Floquet analysis. Floquet analysis. Floquet uh, is, uh, is essentially something related to periodic phenomena. Um, I don't quite exactly know what you're referring to. Uh, it's a long time since I haven't looked at the Floquet theorem. Uh, so I don't quite know, but uh, Basically, what we, uh, the idea here in, uh, in using transfer functions is that uh, we, we know that this is very effective when you, when you do controls. And it's a way to represent a complicated process in a rather simple form, a gain and a phase. And then you can use concepts from uh, controls to study the stability or the instability. So we've done that. Uh, here you've seen that by just looking at the phase, uh, we could say this region will be unstable, this region will be stable. So uh, now the extension of that, which is quite interesting and that we'll see tomorrow, is to use a set of transfer functions. Uh, again, it's a concept that uh, is being used in controls to study nonlinear systems. You, uh, instead of considering a single transfer function, you say the transfer function depends on the amplitude level. And this will allow us to get limit cycles because when you look at it, the instability, usually you are at the limit cycle. You, it's very hard to get the linear uh, variation except in some few cases. But most of the time you look at the limit cycle. But to get the li to the limit cycle, you need something that will depend on the amplitude. And I will show that this this, this is a very nice extension. Yeah. So, so the power I think then relies on the use of extended nonlinearity very naturally? The, the, the power of the flame transfer function is that it can be naturally extended. 
Yes, that, that's, one, that's one very interesting thing, is that the transfer function tells you already the, uh, uh, the stability. You can uh, make a stability analysis of the type that I've shown uh, uh, right now or just before with the sensitive time lag. Uh, it was about the same. Uh, when, when you want to know more, for example, in many cases, you have a, a situation where modes are switching. You know, you, you start with an oscillation and suddenly it switches to a different one. Why is it so? And that can be explained with the describing function. The other case is the, the, the system goes to a limit cycle. And why, what is the, the amplitude of the limit cycle? And also what we see is that the frequency very often shifts. There is a shift in frequency. All of that can be represented with the describing function. Again, this is only um, a, uh, a modeling of a more complicated situation because the flames are nonlinear. They, they can be extinguished. They, uh, it's, uh, it's just a, uh, uh, we, we try to, to have and, and also it's, uh, it's very valuable as an engineering tool. You know, engineers know how to handle uh, linear systems, uh, transfer functions in principle. So it's something that you are used to and uh, it's nice to, to use the transfer function concept. You can measure the transfer functions. You can calculate them. Uh, one way is to use complicated CFD, calculate the transfer functions and then use that uh, to model the stability, the problems, the stability problems. Any other question here? All right. Yeah, you had a question there. Yeah. Say it loud. What does it describe? The question here, you, you make a system. It's a, a, a combustor that is being used in a, in a given application. Will it be stable or will it exhibit oscillations? Usually you don't want to have oscillations. You, you, you do not accept the system to make noise at a given frequency and, and be loud. And in addition, uh, this may uh, cause uh, mechanical degradation and uh, uh, cyclic fatigue. And uh, in extreme cases, you have a failure. You, know, you have a, a piece of uh, equipment which fails because of these oscillations. So you want to design systems which are stable by design, which is not easy to do. Uh, for example, in, in the rocket engines, uh, uh, when, when the F1 engine was developed, uh, it was unstable and uh, that was, uh, uh, could not be used like that. Uh, you, very rapidly, the engine is melting. So uh, that can have a, a terrible uh, effect. So uh, the, uh, these instabilities, for, uh, the, uh, there are many instances where uh, a, a system uh, failed because of instability, combustion instability. You want the system to be stable. The gas turbines, the modern gas turbines, uh, are premixed and as a consequence, much more susceptible to uh, instabilities. So this is why there is a big effort on, on working on this uh, problem. But there are many other devices that can develop instability. It's, uh, I've shown even very simple devices where you have instabilities. Why? Why is it so? Does it answer your question? Yeah. All right, I think it's time to, to stop. Yeah. Uh, let's not do it. So uh, apparently at uh, 1 p.m. we have to meet again, uh, but it, it will be uh, everybody together. I think it's today, yes, isn't it? It's, uh, we have a career development uh, uh, discussion. All right, D a different topic. All right, see you uh, uh, just after lunch. <laughs>